Hello everyone and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week we're going to talk with Dr. Stella Kafka. She is CEO and Executive Director of the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Pretty cool, huh? We're going to discuss the human quest for knowledge, amateur astronomy, and of course, variable stars. But first, we're going to take a look at the future of space exploration as China successfully launches Tianhe, the first module in their upcoming space station. We're also going to take a look forward to the Interstellar Probe, a new idea being designed to view our solar system from the outside far further than any previous spacecraft has yet imagined or reached. The Chinese space station is off to a perfect start following liftoff of the Tianhe Module 2 Earth orbit on April 28th. This first node of the upcoming space station is six and a half meters long and weighs 50 metric tons. During the course of 10 additional missions carried out over 18 months, Tianhe will be joined by two other similar modules forming a second base in space for humans to call home as well as to conduct experiments. Now, typically large booster rockets are purposely deorbited so debris lands away from inhabited areas. The booster rocket used to launch Tianhe, however, was not equipped to do so. The 30 meter long, five meter wide booster rocket with heat resistant tanks was released into space dooming it to crash to Earth in an uncontrolled re-entry. The CSS will orbit alongside a Hubble-class telescope, the Chinese Space Station Telescope. The orbiting outpost is designed to last about 10 years. Now, the interstellar probe being designed by researchers at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab could be the first spacecraft ever to visit deep into the space between the stars. This vehicle, due to launch sometime in the 2030s, will travel out into space to a distance one thousand times greater than that between the Earth and Sun. Once there, the interstellar probe will have an unprecedented chance to study our solar system from the outside for the very first time. On May 25th, we're going to talk with Dr. Elena Pronikovia from the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab talking about this fantastic future journey beyond the solar system. So, make sure to tune in then. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we're going to visit with Dr. Stella Kafka, CEO and Executive Director of the American Association of Variable Star Observers.
this week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. We're happy to be joined by Dr. Stella Kafka. He is CEO and Executive Director of the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Welcome to the show, Stella. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So I a question I like to ask sometimes, and curious about your thoughts on this. Um, it seems like astronomy is something which really connects people together. Uh, we all live under the same sky, and I think everyone at some point when they were a mm -hmm. child asked themselves or asked an adult, what are the stars? So my question is, why is it that what is it about astronomy that brings us all together? That's a fundamental question, actually. I think that what brings us together is the fact that by nature, humans are explorers. I mean, after we manage to clothe ourselves and feed ourselves and find shelter and feel safe, uh, and build our first uh, communities, what we did was to actually go out there and explore nature. We asked what is around us, how it works, how we can actually be part of it. And uh, one of the first questions actually that we asked is um, where do we belong in the universe? We actually looked up and saw this huge sea of dots and beautiful kind of uh, uh, constellations and shapes and forms. And we wondered what they are and what's our, what our place in that is. I think this, this is a, a question that all civilizations have asked one time or another. And this is what actually unites us. It seems that it's part of our DNA, part of who we are to explore and ask questions like that. So. The universe has no physical borders. The universe is around us. Astronomy is actually a collection of individuals who are trying to understand where we belong in the universe. And that's what makes people feel that they are part of an international effort as opposed to um, something that is more focused on their own communities. I think that's what makes us all feel that uh, we are connected under the, the same night sky. Fabulous. And now yeah, your organization uh, is focused, if you'll pardon the pun, um, largely on variable stars. Can you just give us a mm -hmm. brief rundown of what is a variable star and what makes them such darn interesting targets to look at? Variable stars are stars whose brightness is changing uh, within time scales that we can observe, meaning within the same night, uh, within the same week, or within a time, a time frame of a month or even a year, uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with the Earth's atmosphere. They, they don't flicker before because of atmospheric changes or because we see them through a, a different kind of um, th thick uh, part layer of the atmosphere. They change because of intrinsic reasons, because of what is happening around them or what is happening within them. Uh, so variable stars are changing uh, with time. And the, fa the fun fact uh, when it comes to observing them is that every time you go and look at them, you, you see a different brightness from them. Uh, some of them are predictable and some of them are not. So there's always the excitement that, that Perhaps you're looking at a very unique, a new phenomenon in their behavior. But more fundamentally, we are using variable stars in astronomy to define fundamental properties of stars. Have you ever thought or wondered how on Earth we know how far away stars are? It's not that you can take a measuring tape and, you know, you hold one side and I'm going to go to Proxima Centauri with the other one. We'll actually figure out how far away they are. Or have you ever wondered how we know that the sun is four and a half billion years old? How do we know about ages of stars? How do we know about masses, about chemical compositions? How do we know about uh, uh, processes that are happening? Um, they provide very important information about the universe. And um, so what is it that, can you tell us a little bit about why do variable stars, if they change intrinsically, what is it that's 
causing the change and what kind of variable stars are there out there? Ooh, there's a, a zoo of variable stars. So you can take <laughs> the whole year of your podcast to explain them. But let me tell you an example of them. Um, so say that you have two stars that are very close to each other. These two stars are bound by gravity, so they can't escape. Um, imagine the Earth and the, the Moon, for example. They're bound by gravity, so they move around the common center of mass. So it's similar with stars. You have two stars, they move around the common center of mass because they're bound by gravity. Now, um, if the inclination is just right, so their line of, our line of sight is on the, on the um, same um, level as the two stars' uh, orbital period, you see one actually in front of the other. Or so in that case, you see a variation in the overall light of, of uh, the, the system, the binary system, as one star is actually covering its companion or not. Now, we can't exactly take a picture of the two stars. They're so close together that even through the most powerful telescope here on Earth, all you see is a dot. But by, by monitoring the change with time as they move around the common center of mass, by monitoring the brightness variations, you see that the, the light is dimming. So there is a zoo of variable stars out there. Uh, and it would take a lot of time to cover them. But here's an example. When two stars are bound together through gravity uh, and they, they form what we call a binary star system, these stars are moving around the common center of mass in most likely periodic, um, a periodic manner. So if we observe them long enough, we can actually see them moving around the common center of mass. Now here's a fact, even if you have the largest telescope here on Earth, or even the largest space telescope out there, all you see through that telescope from this stellar system is a dot. Mm. You can't tell that you have two stars. You cannot separate them, no matter how powerful your instrument is. So the way that we know that that little dot corresponds to a binary star system is by taking picture after picture after picture of that particular dot and measure the brightness of that system and actually observe the two stars moving around the common center of mass. And if we're lucky, one of them passing in front or behind its companion, stealing some of its light. This is what we call eclipsing binary star systems. And the cool part with those is that those, this type of star and this technique has been known to humans for thousands of years. Uh, the first variable star in the modern recorded history um, appeared in the Cairo calendar the ancient Egyptian script about a thousand years uh, before, um, a thousand years BC. And that was Algol, which is an eclipsing binary star system. And the cool part is that the same technique that ancient Egyptians used in order to uh, monitor and understand and record Algol, a binary star, is the technique that we're using now. And it's the technique that we're using in order to record exoplanet transits. In principle, an exoplanet transit is when you have a little rock, a little planet around a star that is passing in front of a star, covering parts of its star, uh, of the starlight. So you see a drop in the overall brightness of the system. So this is another type of variability. Exoplanet transits are variable star systems. Another another um, reason why those star stars could vary is because. Um, is another case because they go through a very special phase in their life, a very when their interior is under certain instabilities, let's say, uh, and as a result, gravity is trying to shrink uh, the outer layers of the star, whereas radiation pressure that is caused by um, internal nuclear reactions is trying to expand. Uh, the, the layers of the star are not in equilibrium. So there's this battle that is happening within, uh, between gravity and gravitational pressure, and the star literally contracts and expands. So just imagine an object that is larger, much larger than our sun, changing in radius, contracts and ex contracting and expanding in periodic time periods. This is something that we can, we can detect from Earth, and this is what we call a pulsating variable star. 
So we can we can keep going. I can keep telling you why stars, uh, other types of stars that are changing. But these are just a couple of examples. And so, how common are variable stars throughout the galaxy? There are. We don't have a full catalog of them. And you know something. I don't think it would be fair to to characterize them simply because we're discovering variable stars every day. If not anything else, uh, we suspect that about half of the stars in our galaxy is part of, are parts of a binary star system. So we all of those stars have a companion or something like that. Now, among those stars, there's some young stars that are just being built, so they're eating up the uh, material around them. They're variable. They're older stars that explode, so they're variable. They're stars that pulsate, they're stars that rotate, they're stars that, that eject material. Uh, as a result of their immense uh, magnetic fields there, there are all kinds of, of variability types um, that we are detecting and discovering pretty much every day uh, based on our technology advancements. So it wouldn't be fair to, for me to tell you that we know how many stars are variable. I can tell you though that every single star out there is variable at, to some degree. We just can't de detect all variations from the Earth. Hmm. And so as stars evolve, is it fair to say that they go through, most of them would go through periods of differing degrees of variability? Yes, as, as stars evolve, as stars are born, some of them are born with much stronger magnetic fields and magnetic fields can cause a lot of trouble. Look at our sun, our sun is a variable star. It has all kinds of, of activities, spots, flares, coronal mass, e mass ejections, right? And this is a common uh, form of variability in other stars. Um, as stars age, show th their variability type changes, um, but these are changes, these are variations in the star's life that is beyond our time scales, right? We're talking about these changes that happen within billions of years. Um, the, what we call variable stars change or at least exhibit a specific behavior within time scales in our lifetime. Hmm. And there's recently been <clears throat> some study done on a variable star which just because I can't resist, I'm going to call Assassin 21-O-C-O. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> what, what's so fascinating about that star? Assassin 21-O-C-O, oh, it's a very, <laughs> it's a fun story, actually. Um, ASAS dash SN supernova is a survey. Assassin is a survey that <laughs> is looking at the entire sky with its main uh, goal to detect supernovae. Uh, and of course, it, it looks at other types of stars and it, it detects variable stars from time to time. So what happened is that uh, my colleagues from the Assassin survey posted a, a, a tweet that said that they found that one of the stars that was known to be constant in the night sky showed a dimming in its light curve, in its brightness. So something that you think is not changing started dropping in brightness. Mm. So they tagged me on Twitter and I was like, huh, how interesting. So we set an alert in our observers. We sent an email to all our observers and we told them, you know something? why don't we keep observing that star and see what happens with it, right? The interesting thing with that particular one is that it's in the Southern Hemisphere. We're talking about really, really South. So only a handful of observers at the AVSO could, could observe it with, with just assessing as a professional astronomical community um, resource. So in principle, we were very unique in capturing the behavior of that system. That system ended up being an eclipsing binary um, system. And I wouldn't even call it star system because we don't really know what eclipsed what. Uh, it, the eclipse lasted for about 80 days, eight zero, And we managed to capture that particular behavior, the broadening drop, the eclipse, and the recovery very beautifully through our observers. So right now, well, we are at the point where we are... Um, 
collecting all the data. So priority was to get the data first, right? Mm -hmm. So we're putting together all the data and then we're going to take a step back and try to understand the nature of that kind of uh, system. But the cool part with this one is exactly that. It was a, it's a very rare, long period, most likely long period binary star um, whose discovery was announced on Twitter and social media. And our, <laughs> our observers uniquely managed to observe it. So professional observatories were not exactly uh, able to contribute. Even TESS, the space telescope that is out there monitoring the night sky, will go at this sector at the end of May. So it's missing the, uh, the whole action. So that's the fun part with Assassin CO, <laughs> 21 CO. Yeah. Apart from the name, it's really fun to actually <laughs> 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 pronounce. People are just looking at you as in, which industry are you in again? <laughs> what exactly are you guys I tell doing? You, but then I have to kill you. <laughs> are you right? <laughs> it's a secret. No, it's it's a it's a fantastic synergy between our non-professional observers and a target that is super interesting because it might provide a missing link in evolution of these kind of stars. Right. So yeah, yeah of course and no is. one died in the process. That's good. Um, that we know of <laughs> so far. Uh, so, of course, you know, that leads right into the, my next question, which is um, that one of the really, really cool things about astronomy is mm. that it's one of the few fields of science where amateurs can make a significant, significant contributions to professional astronomy. So, you know, what, what is the what are some of the contributions that amateur astronomers can make, uh, especially to the study of variable stars, but also to astronomy in general? Apart from observing them and collecting data, which is something that uh, amateur astronomers can do very uniquely, simply because there aren't enough professional telescopes to observe those stars. Um, amateur astronomers also help with analysis of data and actually what's, uh, what's very val valuable is that amateur astronomers are not, as you mentioned, um, professionally trained astronomers. So they bring in the field of astronomy parts of their own professional preparation, whatever that is. We have many individuals who are very tech savvy, we're many individuals who are very computer savvy, but we also have individuals who come from fields like accounting or they're teachers or they, they are um, uh, working with data, with all types of other types of data, I guess, like uh, uh, traffic, <laughs> or uh, they're working with trains or all kinds of things. So they have certain skills and certain way of looking at data and information from their own professional preparation they bring in the field of astronomy. Um, and the end result is that astronomy becomes multidisciplinary, much richer, much more open to um, actually detect special um, phenomena and understanding special phenomena simply because with that attitude you don't expect the answer you're open-minded to to allow the data to lead you to an answer as opposed to you know oh i'm studying this phenomenon i'm going to just be looking at that phenomenon alone so this is something that uh, our community is definitely contributing and that's why astronomy through the avso's lenses is much richer um i'm the AVSO is not an amateur astronomer organization. It's pretty much an international collaboration consisting of both professional and non-professional astronomers trying to understand some of the most dynamic and fun phenomena in the universe. Uh, for us, it's not necessarily a, a work, what we're doing. It's more of a, a function and a legacy. It's exactly what you said. Non-professional astronomers can, can make a contribution in a very meaningful way. Um, and I think... If not anything else, astronomy is very, very unique in that. Personally, I would never trust an amateur dentist. I would never go to an amateur dentist. Um, but, you know, our... Yeah, I've community... got, got a great deal on heart surgery. I mean, you, uh -huh. you know, yeah, right. guys never done it before, but... I'm sure. on my way. <laughs> <laughs> or I just developed a vaccine. Let me test it on you, right? Um, 
But at the same time, we're talking about a community that contributes to science uh, through data analysis, through building instruments, through improving observing techniques, through writing software, through uh, anal analyzing data and producing science results themselves and publishing the results. So uh, apart from observing those objects. So there's so many different ways that people um, can contribute as members of the AVSO, as members of this community. Um, and actually, maybe some ways that I can't think of right now. Uh, definitely as educators, as uh, science popularizers, and even as role models for the future generation. The, the generation that really wants to be part of space exploration but doesn't have access to the Hubble Space Telescope. All right. And just finally, if people want more information on the AAVSO and become involved, how do they do it? www.avso.org. Our webpage is full of resources and it even has uh, an email that you can contact us, avso at avso.org. Uh, we're here for you, actually. We're here to help individuals to start their own journey in astronomy, any form or shape that they're comfortable being involved in. Uh, we also have webinars um, three times a month, three Saturdays a month. So you're very welcome to learn more and they're free. You're very welcome to learn more about our, our work, our contribution to science, how to actually start your own program through our events. Um, and they're also on our YouTube channel if you miss one or if you would like to, uh, to explore more of what we've uh, talked about in previous um, webinars, previous online events. So again, the AVSO is a resource that aspires to connect people and aspires to enable anyone anywhere to participate in scientific discovery through variable star astronomy. So anyone anywhere is very welcome to join us. Oh, thank you so much. It was great talking with you, Stella. Great talking to you too. Clear Thanks skies. So <laughs> um, and love to have you back on anytime. Any day you, you want me to talk to you about anything you want, let me know. All right, sounds great. And that was uh, Dr. Stella Kafka, CEO and Executive Director of the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Make sure to join us next week when we'll be joined by Dr. Jack Hughes, astrophysicist at Rutgers University, telling us of new findings about supernovae, these powerful eruptions that can mark the end of life for massive stars. And join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. And yes, it's round. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or your favorite podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.